Uh, thank you for joining this session and thanks so much to Dr. Bill Brew for leading it and designing it. Um, this was a really highly requested just interest area for the attendees um, and the other even the advisors on the event and the program itself to have a session on NCLEX, uh, you know, the NCLEX and NCLEX writing and so on. Um, so that's this session. Um, so it's a little bit different from the others because there is some some part on you all to take part and so on and more than just questions. With that said, I think that, you know, similar if you've attended the other sessions, um, it's, you know, similar approach. Uh, you know, we have the chat, um, we have uh, the Q&A. Um, if you have specific questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. If you have a more general comment, you know, put it in the in in the chat, and we'll we'll get to those periodically. And if and if you need anything, you know, that's OpenStax related, technical related, you know, um, we'll we'll the OpenStax team will try to answer that. If it's about you know nursing instruction, uh, the NCLEX itself, that is very much in Dr. Bilber's hands. Uh, uh, so. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining. Thank you again, Dr. Bilbrew, uh, for, for doing this. And oh, I should say one more thing, and I know you'll talk about this too, but um, this is going to be eligible for, you know, continuing ed credit, uh, and we will, in, in, in a little more of an intensive way, you know, we'll be submitting, providing a specific survey at the end uh, that goes into, um, you know, the learning, the session feedback, but also like the learnings from the session and so on. Uh, and, and Dr. Bill will share a bit more on that, but we'll distribute that at the end. Uh, and, and the other piece, sorry, one more logistical item. So this is a long session. We're going until about uh, four, uh, sorry, yeah, 4 p.m. Central. So if we feel like we need a little break in the middle, uh, maybe, you know, we won't we won't go off Zoom or shut it down or anything like that. But if, if necessary, you know, we'll see how we feel. We could say, hey, five minutes of, of you know, whatever's needed, uh, but we'll see how things are going. Okay. A lot of preamble for me. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry. Ah, sorry. One more thing. Um, uh, if anybody needs captioning, uh, please go ahead uh, and. Um, uh, oh wait. Oh yes, there is the show captions button. It's either on the bottom of your screen, or if, if you if you need to click the more button, uh, you can go to the captions. This session will be recorded. Um, the uh, uh, um, actually. Yes, I, it will be recorded. Uh, I don't think the CEU credits apply the same way if it's, if you want, view the recording, uh, you know, in terms of that. But uh, but we'll, we will be recording it. Thanks so much. Take it away. All right. Are you seeing the right screen? This is, looks great. Thank you. Y'all are seeing the right screen. The okay, good. Yeah. All right. So um, if you didn't join me last session, my name is Dr. Emerald Bilbrew. I currently teach. Um, at Fayetteville Technical Community College here in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and beforehand was at uh, University of Pembroke, um, University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Um, I've taught across the curriculum from first years to second years in uh, BSN and uh, ADN and MSN programs. Um, I have a lot of experience with the next gen stuff. Um, before it was even next gen, I was actually ironically teaching my class in this method of uh, an unfolding case study um, just made sense to me. So when they came out with next gen, it was easy for me to learn how to write um, these particular questions. And I have um, actually been on several projects um, through another uh, company where I've written several, both RN and PN uh, next generation uh, study guides using these uh, particular type of questions. So I have a lot of um, background in next gen before they even really brought it out totally. Um, so it's kind of been a passion of mine to teach other instructors how to uh, get around their barriers with it because anytime something's new, it's already hard to change what you've been doing for a long time. But item writing is something that takes a long time for new instructors to really get their head around in the first place. And now NCLEX comes and changes the formatting type two times over all at one time. So I like to do these. I've done these a couple of uh, different ways for the actual faculty in my uh, school that I work in. Um, and it, I think it makes a big difference just to understand even the changes before you start trying to write these. So, um, did it go? There we go. Um, as far as disclosures, I don't have any really disclosures for this particular session. Um, the 
ability to obtain CEUs for this uh, particular session. You have to attend the whole session and you'll have to complete the post-session evaluation. And that's pretty much with any CEUs. I'm sure y'all are very familiar with that if you're on here and you're already a nurse. Um, our objectives, we're going to be able to uh, relate each step of the nursing process to the uh, CJMM tag. And that's one of the most important things when you're starting to learn about the CJMM was the clinical judgment measurement model that uh, NCLEX has come out with to understand how to write these. You're going to be able to look, uh, describe at least three of the new question formats that are on uh, next gen. Um, you're going to be able to describe what tabs are and how they need to be used when you're doing trending questions. Um, and you're going to be able to uh, discuss how case study uh, questions are formatted, tagged, and presented on NCLEX. So um, in 2023, the NCLEX uh, RN test plan changed its formatting um, to use the uh, clinical judgment measurement model, which is what the CJMM stands for, um, when measuring their examinee success on the NCLEX board licensure exam. It's also on the PN as well, but I'm focusing on the RN here. So in case there's any differences, just be aware I'm focusing on the RN NCLEX, not the PN. Um, the measurement model was created by the uh, NCSBN as a result of research that they conducted um, when they wanted to evaluate um, how nurses focused their day-to-day -day, um, decision-making um, when it comes to patient M care. Research was designed to explore new ways of taking their clinical judgment that we have to do in the nursing pro uh, profession every day and put it into an actual way to test these students coming out and see, are they able to think in this manner? Um, the CJMM is kind of what came out of this research um, as a framework in order to fairly measure your students' ability to both think cl clinically, um, make better clinical judgment and make better decision-making within the context of a standardized exam. Um, the decision to create this difference um, was driven by their desire to really look at a student in a different way versus just giving them a multiple choice or a, uh, select all the apply and say, oh, they can answer a simple question. They wanted to come up with a way that they're giving them more of a scenario. And I think over time, NCLEX has slowly become more scenario based, but they've always been standalone single scenario questions. They wanted something more in depth. They wanted to be able to give them more information like you would have when you go to the hospital and have them decipher what information they actually need. Um, how does it apply to the question they're asking? And for them to actually make a judgment as if they were there with that patient. Um, sort of almost judging them as if they were in the clinical environment and not just sitting there reading something off of a piece of paper. So that's how they formatted this CJMM to be able to measure that. So the first thing um, that they did when they converted to this test model, they included several different types of changes on their standardized exam. So they come up with some new formats in the standalone question format. So that's your regular question that doesn't have anything leading to it. It's just by itself. They actually have formatted changes in those. Um, they also have questions that are not standalone anymore. They have the case study questions and they also have what they call a trending format question. They also changed their score, uh, the way they score them now. The scoring model is actually different. There is also some changes that they came up with in the actual client needs categories. The category changes aren't as drastic. So uh, you'll see under the safe and effective care environment, the management of care increased by 2%, and then they took safety and infection control down by one, and pharma, farm and parental, ther parental therapies down by one. Um, the reason I think they did that, and when we get into the CJMM, you'll see management of care encompasses so much stuff that actually comes out of a case study a whole lot easier than individual questions that would be more focused to one safety question or one farm question. I really can see why they would push it that way. When we go through the CJMM model, you'll see that I think that it makes it more sense that they did that. It's not, as you can see right here, it's not a big, big change, but it 
it does make a big impact when you're trying to write these questions. Um, so this is the new test plan model from 2019 to 2023. Like I said, it's only those little changes underneath there. So it's not a big drastic change on the actual intensity of the information you need to teach them. You don't start have to start teaching more. Well, I need to teach them a whole lot of, you know, reduction to risk potential questions. You don't really have to change any of that. It's more or less making sure your students understand the new formats, understand what is expected of them. If they get this matrix question, do they know how to even answer that? Um, there's also some tips I'll tell you later on about that you can actually teach your students to give them a heads up and actually help them do better on the NCLEX for some of these next gen items. So some other changes they did make when they went to next gen is some of your length and other things. So old NCLEX, new NCLEX, the maximum time is five hours. The old NCLEX obviously didn't have any case studies. They are gonna have at a minimum three case studies, 18 test items is what that's gonna account for because every case study has six items to it. Um, and that's the maximum as well. So no matter what, no matter how many questions they get, they're gonna have 18 questions that are formatted in three case studies. Um, the standalone clinical judgment models, um, they didn't have any on the old NCLEX because again, this is part of the new CJMM. The um, minimum that they might have on the new um, test would be zero, but they could have up to seven items. Your multiple response, these are the basic ones that you're used to on the old NCLEX. Used to be 60 to 130 items. Now it's 52 to 110 because you have those questions for the case study that are definitely going to be there. Scored items, 60 to 130, it's now 70 to 135, and it still stays the same as those, you know, the test questions they give them with, that they're trying to see how they do in the future, if they're going to use them on NCLEX or 15 still. Here are some of the scoring changes. So it used to be you got it wrong or you got it right. That's the classic scoring, zero or one. They still have that on some of those regular standard, you know, multiple choice um, items. They um, either get all of it correct or all of it wrong. That's going to be your like A, B, C, D, pick one of them, right? But now they've added plus or minus scoring and rationale scoring rules. And that's because of the type of questions. It is very highly recommended that when you start incorporating, if you haven't already, incorporating these next-gen questions on your exams that you give your students in your program, that you also include, at the very least, the plus or minus scoring. That's going to apply to stuff like your SATAs, um, some of the um, matrix questions and stuff like that. And on the next slide or the slide after, I'll show you which ones it applies to exactly. But it's very unfair not to score them the same way that the next gen is going to score them if you're going to give them the same questions that they're going to receive on the next gen. So a good example of this is if you have a multiple choice, you did an extended SATA. So there's eight to 10 options that they can choose. If four of those 10 options that you gave them are correct, and that particular problem was worth one point, that means each answer the choice they have would be 0 0.25, right? Easy math, because I'm not very good at math this time of the day. So 0 0.25. Well, if they got two of the correct answers, that means they would get 0 0.50 out of the one point they could get. However, if they also chose one of the wrong answers, then one of the right answers is canceled out and they only get 0.25. So basically for every right answer you get, you'll get points for that and every wrong answer you get cancels out one of the other ones that you got right. It's a lot of extra math, I know, and you almost have to literally, unless you are lucky enough to have a program that does it for you, you have to go in there and do that yourself. Um, we're on ATI here, so ATI scores all of the um, rationale scoring rules for us, which thank God because those are a little more difficult. Um, but if we put a regular SATA in there, we have to go hand score these. That's the only reason I know how, how much we have to do with those. Um, so I tend to stay away from those and I'd rather go with the extended score so they can just do that for me because it's a lot of extra work we have to go through every test. Um, 
they can never get more than zero, less than zero, and they can never get more than one. So if they chose all wrong answers, you don't turn around and say, oh, that's a negative two. That don't, that's not how it works. They either get zero or they get the max score. So if they got them all right, it's going to be, you know, that whole point. However, if they chose all the right answers and chose one wrong answer, well, there you go. Now we minus one, they get 0.75. So I hope that's as clear as mud. Um, it makes more sense when you're actually doing these things, because I think it took me a couple of times to actually grading these to understand that. But um, it is a lot more work on us. It is. But again, it's in all fairness. If we're going to be expecting them to do a lot more and learn a lot more just to answer the question, then the least we can do is learn a lot more on our end to be able to properly grade the question. Um, so the other rule is the rational scoring rule. It requires a full understanding of paired information. And this is, I said it was a little harder, but it's only harder because of the ATI we use. It, it requires us to go in and actually pull up the test because you can't see it on the screen, the sheet. It's actually not harder if you have a program like maybe ExamSoft that shows you the whole thing because we used to be on ExamSoft. If you have ExamSoft, it'd be a whole lot easier because then you can go and check box and it'd be fine but it means that both have to be correct. So for example, one of the type of questions you have is a drop down close where you are filling in a sentence and there's a box that you have to pick an answer from. Well, if X and Y must be correct to earn the point because, hey, you can't have this right if this is not right, then both have to be right to get the points. That's just how it is. Um, if it's three of them in there, then all three of them have to be correct if they relate. If there's another part of the question that they have that doesn't relate, they still can get a point for that. So try to think of a good example. If I said um, I have to have peanut butter and jelly to make my sandwich and a carrot on the side, the carrot on the side has nothing to do with my peanut butter and jelly. So I can have the carrot wrong, but the peanut butter and jelly better both be there or I'm missing the whole question. So that's kind of how that works. So I said it's a little bit more in, in depth, but it's harder to grade depending on what type of uh, program you're using because unless you have one that's going to give you the entire question out, most of your um, exam software tends to just say this was a, an uh, engine question and we graded it. So you don't get to see all of that. That's the unfortunate thing that um, with the new next gen, they, they really haven't mapped it out wonderfully where it shows you all of the little details when they've created next gen. So it's a little unfortunate on that, but at least they grade that one for you. Um, so let me move this back over so I can see it. So um, according to the NCSBN, the decision as to whether the candidate passes or fails, the NCLEX is governed by actually three scenarios. Um, the first one is your 95% confidence rule interval. Um, this scenario is actually the most common for somebody who takes the NCLEX. So the computer is gonna stop administering items when it is 95% certain that the candidate is actually clearly above or clearly below the passing standard. And if you're not quite sure how, um, um, what I'm talking about, on NCLEX itself, they have a perfect video that talks about this comp confidence interval rule, but there is like this line of basic, you're safe to be a nurse questions that they ask, and you should be above that 95% of the time to say that you have passed this NCLEX, or you're below it 95% of the time and it says you're not passing the NCLEX, but there's like this bottom level of you are safe to be a nurse that they are considering these certain questions that they write, and that's how they consider you're 95% above or 95% below, and they fail you or pass you. Um, the second scenario is your maximum length exam. So some candidates are like straddling the fence the whole time. They're very close to that passing or failing standard. And when this is the case, the, com the computer is gonna continually give them all the items it can until the maximum number has been reached. At this point, it disregards the 95% rule and considers it as a final ability to estimate. The final ability estimate is at or above the passing standard and the candidate will pass or it's gonna be below the passing standard and they fail. So when we can't reach a 95% conclusion because they're all over the place, they get the max number of questions and they say, okay, now let's look at it. Were they more 
above or more below, and that's when they'll decide you passed or failed. And then the last one is the run out of time rule. Now you would think with well, five hours, you wouldn't run out of time, right? Well, I've had a couple students do it. Um, that to be said, if you, that's just a side note, if you have a student that's in your program who gets any special accommodations for their testing because they need extra time, even though they're gonna tell you they don't want it, really, really, really try to get them to take it because that's what was going on with this particular student. I all but begged her to go get, because you can actually get accommodations for the NCLEX if you're getting them in school. I begged her, she didn't do it and she failed because she literally ran out of time. Like I said, you would think five hours is long enough to take these tests, but when you have severe test anxiety, that ain't always the case. Um, so if they run out of time, before they reach the maximum number of items and they can't determine that 95% certainty, whether you passed or failed, then we have, they use a third alternate criteria. Um, if you have the student, the student or examinee hasn't answered the minimum uh, number of required items, then the candidate automatically fails. If they at least answered the minimum number required, um, then they're going to use that final ability estimate that they would have used when they got all the questions to be able to decide, did they pass or did they fail? So if you have a student that's so slow, they don't even answer that minimum 60, 70, 80 questions, they only get to 30, well, they fail automatic. They didn't even have enough time to determine the 95%. And if they make it past that point and they didn't get through all of them, but they at least got past that point, then at least you get a fair, fair look at, well, here's where they were when they got to that point and they're either gonna pass or fail them based, by, um, based on their um, responses by that point. So as far as the NCLEX formats, there are different grade uh, scoring for each of the formats, like I said. So you have your classic scoring, that's the one you either got it all right or you got it all wrong. Your regular multiple choice are still going to be on that. Multiple matrix multiple choice is going to be on that. Um, multiple response select in. And I'm going to go through all of these because some of these are you're probably like, what the heck is she talking about? There is a lot of different kind of questions now. Um, if you weren't familiar with them before, some of these actually were probably already on there and you might not have ever had uh, use of them in your course. But these some of them were actually already on here. But multiple response select in or classic scoring drop down close drag and drop down close, drop down tables. Those are all the classic scoring. Your plus and minus are gonna be your matrix, matrix multiple response, um, multiple response select all that apply, um, highlight text and highlight table, and then your multiple response groupings. And then for the rationale scoring, the only thing they use is the dra drop down uh, rationale and drag and drop down rationale. So it's the only two that have to deal with that rational one. When you're writing um, NCLEX style questions, whether it's next gen or not, when you write any kind of test, you guys kind of got to be on the same page as what kind of terminology you're going to use. Um, so if you're going to write tests for your class, you might as well already write stuff that is using the same terminology as NCLEX. Um, so they're going to use client instead of patient. It's so easy to write patient when for the longest we were writing patient, they're like, no, don't do that anymore. So you should use client instead of patient. And client is not just necessarily an individual. Your client could be the community. Your client could be the family. So it just depends on what part you're talking about and how the question's uh, listed. Um, order is going to be for any kind of treatment or intervention that the primary care provider um, orders. When we use prescription only if it's related to a medicine. So Sometimes it used to be used interchangeably that they, the doctor prescribed this healthcare care regimen. If it's not a medicine, you don't use prescribed anymore. Um, it's only ordered. It's prescribed only if it's a medicine. Um, health care provider, primary health care provider. Um, I think that's been for a long time that we don't put doctor anymore or physician. I think sometimes it's easy to slip and put it, but it's not used anymore. There's too many uh, primary care providers that we see now, nurse practitioners, physician assistants that are the ones they see and not the doctors. And then unlicensed assistive personnel, that's going to be your CNAs, your um, med techs, anybody who's not licensed to be caring but has some kind of um, certification. 
some other terminology that um, we should use when you're writing next gen format questions are going to be stuff that are more about the wording versus the actual term. So you should use client reports instead of client complaints of. Um, they don't like labeling of the client. So you wouldn't say the diabetic client. They use client with the diagnosis of. So client with diabetes is how they would label it. Um, and I know this sounds real nitpicky. Every time I teach this class, it always sounds so nitpicky to me. But what I find is the more consistent my wording is with NCLEX, the better they're going to do. Because when I used to teach across the curriculum, I would teach 114 and then teach 213. So that's the first year course and the second year course. The ones that had my first year course had this wording. And when they get to my, third, my 213 course, they were already used to seeing it that way. I know you've had students, the first thing they say is, I'm scared to take this, the instructor's first test because I don't know how they word the questions. When we use the same terminology, it's better for our students overall. So I know this sounds nitpicky because every time I, I do this part, I always sit there feeling like I'm just nitpicking off somebody. But really, and honestly, we all have our own words and our own vernacular. Lord knows I do. And writing that book that I just wrote with them showed me that I really have a lot of Southern terminology that I don't know I use. Um, but keeping it consistent is really the best thing for your students when it comes to the NCLEX. Um, so these are the terms that they use. That's why I'm going over these, even though I feel like I'm nitpicking. So client reports, client with the diagnosis, provider or healthcare provider, um, full terms. It's so easy for me to put HTN for hypertension because I've been writing it that way for years, but uh, we need to use the whole term, just like hyperlipidemia. Yeah, on my report sheet, I still put HLD, but they need the whole term. They're not nurses yet. And if they are an LPN becoming an RN, lovely. They're the only ones who got it right because they knew that. Um, generic medication names instead of tra trade medication names. NCLEX only uses generic. They do not put any trades on there. So um, it has to be generic. Um, generic equipment terms. This is one I still struggle with. So instead of Foley catheter, which everybody calls a Foley catheter, indwelling urinary catheter, because I'm sure there's a, another brand out there, but everybody, you know, it's like Kleenex. Everybody knows what a Kleenex is, or so you think, but somebody from another country may never have heard of Kleenex. So we can't use the equipment name either. Um, nurse or client, stay away from personal pronouns. He, she, you know, any of that. The nurse does this for the client. Um, and then active present tense. Um, when you use hypothetical or awkward tense wording, it kind of confuses them some. So instead of asking what would the nurse do or what can the nurse be expected to do, that's like asking hypothetically, what do you think? You should say, what should the nurse do? You're asking them, what are they fit to do right now? Not what would they do maybe? That you need to be more succinct with that. And then relevant information only. So unless it's imperative to answer the question, you don't need to know that the, the patient is a female, 23 year old, African-American married, you know, female for with 20 kids. Unless we have to know that because we're in labor and delivery and this is her 20th para or whatever, we don't need all that. And unless this is a question about her marital status and her psychosocial needs related to that, we just don't need that. Um, it's, it's easy to see when we look at these questions that it sounds like you're, they're given more information because in the case study, they're given a lot of information they may not need, but it's not this kind of information. It's the information you would actually see on the floor. Like I'm giving you the whole chart. Here's the labs, here's the nurses notes, here's the, the, the progress notes, and here's the, the radiology report. Now, what is important from what they're showing, what we're seeing right now with them? So yes, you get more with ne the next gen, but it's not more as in a bunch of extra words that really mean nothing ever in as far as their care. I guess is the best way to say it. So only relevant information that might actually hinder or, or help their care in one way or the other. So um, the CJMM model does have specific tagging that's used to determine um, the examinee's ability to critically think and make judgments based on a specific action that each tag is requiring. 
Um, the case study questions not only contain a question for each tag, but they are presented in a specific order. These six tags relate to a specific part of the nursing process. And it's best if you view the tags in this way, because we all know nursing process. By the time your students get to the second year, they are tired of hearing about nursing process. So they are very familiar with that. If you line it up like I have it on the, the, the grid right here, it makes a lot more sense to us and it makes a lot more sense to them. The only one that gets a little confused is the anal analysis one. And we're gonna go over in detail each of these because even though analysis is on there twice, you're analyzing something different. But this little grid right here has been a lifesaver from the first time I started writing these questions. And it has been a lifesaver to my students because using this, you actually can teach them an NCLEX hack that we'll get to later. So um, the CJMM tags are designed to force them to look at their clinical competence. This is the whole thing that that all, God knows how many years of research went into it because I don't know, but if I know anything about big standardized nursing, anything, they probably looked at this for 20 years before they decided to change it. But this is how they mapped it out. Some people are more pictorial. So I always like to have a lot of pictures in my um, presentations because if you're a visual person, this might be more helpful for you. I do the same thing for my students. Um, but this is the layers of the nursing process and where they felt each of it fit in. If you look at the, the environmental factors and the individual factors and how they, they fit in with each of the tags, if you're a more visual person, this might help you more than me explaining it. So I'm putting this in here for those who are more visual. And then those are not, we're gonna talk about each of them. So your recognized cues is always your first one. It is part of your assessment um, as far as the nursing pro process. These que questions should evaluate whether or not the examinee knows what to assess and how to assess those things. This can be in the context of either a healthy or an ill client. For example, does the examinee know how to assess skin, skin turgor on a patient with the diagnosis of fluid volume deficit? And how to assess that skin turgor? Do they know that they should be pinching the skin to see if it tents? Um, does the examinee know how to assess the abdomen of a healthy client? So it doesn't just mean like basic assessment, they know how to assess somebody. Do they know when a person has liver disease, they should be assessing their abdomen because they might have ascites. They should be assessing their skin because they might be jaundiced. So based in the context of whether they're healthy or they have a disease and that specific disease, do they know what they should be assessing and how to assess that? The analyze cues is your first analysis. And the, for this part, the questions are designed to determine if the examinee understands the assessment findings that they gather. Do they know what that means when they get this information after they have assessed them? For example, if they did assess the skin turgor and they found tight edema, do they know that this is abnormal and it's actually related to fluid overload. Can they assess a client with a disease and recognize what findings are actually going to be demonstrating a complication and it's not something you should find? So if you have a client who's on peritoneal dialysis, they should know that, hey, um, they are going to have a catheter sticking out and you should be able to assess the area. But do they know when they assessed it and now just breathing on the person's abdomen, they're screaming in pain, that should tell them they're in uh probably have a peritonitis and that's something we need to deal with. That's your analyzing part. Here's the information. Something's not right. Do you know that? That's what the first level of analysis is. Taking the information they assessed and knowing whether it's normal or abnormal. Is it something I expected or not expected? And that's going to be in the context of the disease or the healthy person. So that's why it gets it's several levels because you got to know that disease we're talking about. Are you talking about a liver failure patient? Are you talking about a patient with heart failure? Because with heart failure, if I have tight skin turgor, then I know you're in fluid overload. That's possibly a complication you're about to deal with. I need to know that I need to do something about that. Which leads into the next part of it. The second part of analysis is prioritizing hypothesis. Um, these questions are designed to evaluate your prioritization skills, 
Can the examinee now take that information they found on assessment that they analyzed and determine what is the most important thing I need to do? So now I have this patient who's in heart failure and they got this really bad fluid overload. I'm hearing crackles. I'm seeing that they have tight skin turgor and they got fluids going at 100 cc's an hour. Do I know I need to stop those fluids because that's what says on the chart is going and call the doctor and say, hey, we're giving them 100 cc's an hour like a lunatic and, you know, they're now in fluid overload. And that's the most priority thing. This is the one that catches students because they always want to do ABCs. And I'm sorry, but unless they ain't breathing, A may not be the answer. So we'll talk about that in a little bit about priority frameworks that's going to help them with NCLEX too. But this is the second level of the analysis when they're able to take the information they got from the assessment, know what it means, and now say, this is what I have to do and this is what's most important. And this is the stuff that we do. If you think about it, you've been a nurse for a long time. This is what you do on the floor. You looked at the patient. You found out this was a problem that they're probably, you know, going to have this complication. Here's the first thing I need to do. The next step is your generate solutions. This is the planning stage. So now I've decided what I need to do first. The questions are on this section are designed to evaluate whether they're able to use the information and create an actual care plan for that specific patient. Okay, so I know I'm going to stop the fluids, but that's the first step. What else do I need to do? Now they're in fluid overload. Do I need to be looking at possibly they need Lasix or um, do I need to put in a Foley? Whatever they, you know, they, they come up with some weird stuff. But whatever it is, do they now know what the picture looks like for this patient that they found this problem with, that they have said these are the things they need to do? They need, do they now know how to create a plan of care? After they resolve that problem, what are we going to look at? Um, can they decide what is important? important for that particular care, uh, that client for their interventions to address whatever issue they have. And even if it's a healthy client, when you're looking across the lifespan, do they know what is needed to keep that patient healthy? So this isn't always something that's going to be looked at as somebody who's totally ill. Um, you can actually run through this, this CJMM in a fundamentals class with a normal patient. You can take an elderly patient who is healthy otherwise, but they're bed bound. You can make the whole system with just that because now they're at risk for this, this, and this. So you're at risk fours can also go through the same process when you're trying to do this with your first level students. I've had a, a lot of um, extra training that I've done for my, my uh, first year instructors with this because they feel like, well, we teach the, which would be essentially fundamentals for y'all, but it's um, nursing 111 for us because we're a constant base. Um, and they're teaching all the basic stuff, their basic assessment. And they're like, well, we teach all the normal stuff. We can't use this. Yes, you can. Because even a normal patient has an at risk for. Once you teach them that they're at risk for something, you are already driving them to, okay, here's what you assess. If you found this, what does that mean? What do you do first for that patient to prevent that from happening? Because when they're at risk for, it now becomes a prevention type care plan and a prevention and prioritizing, right? Um, the last couple ones are your implementation, which is taking action. They're designed to determine if the uh, examinee knows how to implement the plan skills um, and other skills needed for the client care. So if we were talking about a patient who's just at risk for bed sores, do they actually know what they need to do what action they need to take to prevent the bed sores? Do they understand that they need to turn them every two hours? Do they understand that they need to look at their nutritional status, um, their fluid, um, uh, make sure that they're not dehydrated? Do they understand those actions that they need to take to ensure those things? And then the last step is your evaluation, which is evaluate outcomes. I think that's the easiest one to remember because it says evaluate and evaluation is part of the nursing process. So that's probably the only one that's easiest to remember. Um, and these questions, are designed to determine if the examinee understands how to evaluate the outcomes of those interventions and what parameters they need to look at to evaluate that intervention. Um, and then what actions may lead to, um, uh, they need to lead to when their plans don't go as planned. So if they have an undesired outcome, do they know what they need to do to fix that? So this sounds like it should be easy. Well, you know, I gave them a blood pressure medicine and their blood pressure is now lower. But it's not always that easy. When you have the context of a more complex disease, they may actually have to look at labs and a nursing note just to derive 
to the fact that, hey, did all the interventions we do actually work? So depending on what their case study that they get on NCLEX is about, their evaluate outcomes could be just as hard as the very first step um, because you may have to look at multiple things. For instance, you have somebody who's in uh, acute renal failure that's not gonna come out of it as total renal failure now. Well, you're educating them on nutrition and all this other stuff, but you've also had to give them something because their potassium went sky high. You also had to get a new dialysis access along the way. When you get to the end, you're looking at labs, you're looking at fluid volume status, you're looking at um, patient uh, ability to do teach back and tell you what you taught them. There could be 101 things that they throw at them and evaluate outcomes that may sound like it should be the easiest step, but it may not be. It just depends on what disease process you started with. So educating your, your students in this manner is gonna strengthen their ability to muddle through this. And when we first started, you know, coming up upon the, you know, the next gen NCLEX, I think a lot of people were so worried there was going to be a big dip. But a lot of students, I think, because you're able to give them a picture, you know, uh, you give them a storyline in, in their head of what's going on with this patient. A lot of them have done really well because they're able to look at it and say, OK, I can relate this to something in clinical and this is what I would do. And they're able to walk through it a little better. It's when they come up on the disease process they've never heard about and they just throw everything out the window that becomes more of a problem. So we have to give them something to back themselves up when that becomes a point. Um, so you wanna ensure um, that questions are written um, with relevant learning objectives to ensure the relevancy. So when you're doing this for class, you need to know what objectives you have before you start to sit down and do any kind of case study, um, trending question, any other kind of question of any sort. Um, the information being tested in the question really needs to reflect the entry level nurse, um, nurse's knowledge as the needs for NCLEX are gonna test for that same level. Um, a lot of our um, testing products that we lean on like I've, and I've dealt with a lot of them, HESI, M, ATI, um, Kaplan, those are the ones that come in my mind. I'm sure I've used something else, but those are the ones that come to my head right now. Those, majority of those are testing on a nursing level of being on the floor at least one year. That's why you're able to get the, the guarantees that they give us that if your student can get to this level, they have this much percent chance of passing the NCLEX the first time. It's because they're actually testing them on a harder level than what the NCLEX tests them. Um, I've had a lot of students that tell me, oh man, ATI was harder than the NCLEX because it's designed to be. Um, that does not necessarily mean that we have to actually write our test questions to be that hard. Uh, when you're so focused down on a disease, you, you gotta kind of remember when you're, you're teaching your course that you're being very, very specific on one disease. That's great, but they may never even see that disease on NCLEX. They need to know the most important stuff. We're bad about putting in the extra fluff still in courses. They need to know what's most relevant about a person that you're taking care of with that disease. So when you're writing your questions, be thinking about that. When a person goes on the floor for the first time and they have this patient with the disease, what is the most relevant things they need to be looking for, they need to be assessing, and they need to be doing for this client? What are the most relevant complications that are most likely to happen? Don't give me a complication that happens in like one in 500 billion people because I probably will never see it. It's like we talk about VTAC with uh, a pulse. I've been a nurse 22 years and I'm not saying it don't happen, but I ain't never seen somebody with VTAC with a pulse. It doesn't happen very often. And I've been in cardiac for a long time. I've never seen it, not once. But and my husband's in 30 years. He ain't seen it either. So it's something that I talk about, but I don't go into a great detail. I say, this can happen. You don't do this and you do this and I move on because the likelihood of them seeing that is very low. So you don't want to, to stress questions and, and teach a bunch on a, prod, uh, you know, a, a specific topic, topic that they'll probably never see. So think about that when you're writing your questions and you're writing your objectives, when you're trying to, to decide what you're going to put in these questions, test them on the stuff that's going to be the most important, the stuff that you really want to stick out, um, because that's what's going to be more likely to be on the NCLEX too. Their goal is not to test them necessarily from some disease that they never heard of, although you can be in school for nursing 10 years and still run across a disease you ain't never heard of and to be on the NCLEX. So I'm not saying it don't happen, but 
focus on the most important things because that's going to be what you want your students to really know. Um, be sure you're reflecting the nursing scope. And I have had this in my own nursing school where you're asking me a question that I will never do as a nurse because the whole idea is to put it in the scenario of what the nurse will do. So me as a nurse are not going to stage this cancer and give that diagnosis to the patient. So don't ask me to stage the cancer and give the diagnosis to the patient because it's not going to happen. And NCLEX is not going to ask them that because they're not testing them outside of the scope of their practice. So be aware that you're not supposed to ask them those kind of questions or you shouldn't. Um, use the NCLEX test pet plan as a guide when you create your exam blueprints, um, particularly if you run a course like I do. So I, the course I'm in now, um, I teach the capstone course, which is the last one they have. So the first half of the course is the last bit of course content they get. And the second half is all NCLEX prep. And when I do the exams, I try to make sure because we have a million tags, right? We have the Bloom's tags, we have the engine, uh, the next, the NCLEX tags, we have the freaking million tags, right? We got a million tags. Well, with all those freaking tags, make the ones for NCLEX more like what the NCLEX is. So the NCLEX plan that I gave you earlier, where this many is parent, uh, you know, parental and, and pharmacology therapy, keep yours around that level. There's no sense unless you're teaching a pharmacology course that you're giving them. 50 question test and 25 of them are meds. That's just so uneven. I understand meds are important, but at the same time, the other information that you're missing out on when you're overdoing the meds is other stuff that they need too. Um, so make sure that you're using the NCLEX test plan for those other tags that you have. Um, use familiar vocabulary, avoid culturally specific words. Um, we have a high population at this school of English as a second language. So much so that um, my study uh, skills that I do with them, I have a whole study method for people who um, English is their second language. And I let them know during a test, the worst that I can say is no, I can't tell you because that's going to give you the answer. But I encourage them to ask me if there's a, a, a word in the question that they don't understand, because as much as I try, there's still some words that we use so much, we don't even understand that it's actually culturally an American word and not just a word that's used everywhere. So it, it takes some, some practice not to use a cultural specific word because we're used to living here. And if we have never lived anywhere else, we don't realize it's a word just we use. Um, use positive wording instead of negative. And I was very guilty of this. I used to love putting me some negative uh, test questions together, but NCLEX not doesn't do um, a whole lot of it. So they stay away from it as much as possible. It's very seldom that it's gonna be a negative stem. Um, and it's not just what not to do, it's stuff like what response by the client means that they need further teaching. That's a negative response. Even when I go back and look at the, the exam review with my students, sometimes when I run across a negative one, I have to sit there and think about it because now I gotta think about what the reverse was so that I can get the right answer. It's very, very confusing when you get the negative. Um, if you put any on your test, one or two is enough. And it's really only to teach them that you should read the question and pay attention to detail because 90% of your class is probably gonna miss it. Um, they're so stressed out from just taking the test that they're not paying attention to not accept um, further teaching, all these things that say, this is not the correct answer, pick the not correct answer because they're so geared to picking the correct answer that they don't even look at it. Um, use plausible distractors and distractors are the wrong answer choices. If every of the other answers look so wrong, you really aren't testing me on anything. If you have, you know, the patient is uh, desatting and you have your choices as put them on oxygen, take their temperature, take their blood pressure and push them out of the bed. I mean, I'd be an idiot not to choose put oxygen on them, right? So make sure you're distractors are actual plausible, actually plausible, something that they might actually choose. Uh, looking at your item analysis would help to make sure you're doing that. Because if you have answer choices that nobody ever picked, you want to make that a stronger choice. And, you know, some people think, oh, this is about, this is about tricking them. No, it's not. It's about making them a better, stronger test taker um, and making your test more valid. Proofread your questions have someone else proofread your question before you really release the exam. 
Um, I think that's a, a biggest pet peeve of mine because I, I don't know if I have anything in here. Please excuse me if something is backwards. I truly have dyslexia and dyscalculia. So I have to double check and triple check mine all the time. Um, and even if I didn't have that, I think I still would have somebody proofread it because I'm sure I'd misspell something, but I definitely have a disability. So I'm telling you, you definitely want somebody to proofread it because if I just left it to my own devices and never proofread anything, I'm sure my students would be sitting there very confused, just trying to figure out what I wrote. Um, and then when you're writing the stem or the question itself, give a context to the situation. And that's what the next gen is trying to do with every question, even the standalone. You're gonna use the context of, nursing care, the nurse is doing this for the client. Um, identify the step of the nursing process if it's relevant to the question, present it in a clear and concise um, way with relevant information, and then ask a specific question. Um, when you teach your study skills and stuff, if you're teaching that to your uh, students, showing them how to figure out what the question is, is believe it or not, highly important. A lot of times these questions, they're so busy trying to muddle through the weeds and figure out what you're even asking them that they miss it because they simply don't know what you're asking. The more relevant and more succinct that question is, the easier it is for them to find that. But I find that sometimes nursing questions, because we do have to give that scenario, it tends to be like a word math question where I gave you a bunch of numbers, but which ones do you actually need to answer this question? So I like to do when I do my study skills with them is show them how to actually read what the question's asking. Because if you give them a whole test with one medicine listed in there and never ask them a single question about the medicine, most of your students are gonna fail that test because they freak out once they see a medicine on there. I don't know this medicine. The question wasn't even asking about the medicine. I asked you what color the sky was. They never read that because they, the, the anxiety that gets built up in some of them when tests hits them is that they just don't even read the question. So calming them down and teaching them to read the stem and making sure you're actually putting a clear and concise question so they know, okay, well, you're actually asking me about this makes it a whole lot easier for them to decipher. So this was the part where we were supposed to have the breakout rooms. Um, I was gonna have you work as groups. I wanted you to pick one of the tags. So you know that you have recognized cues, analyze cues, you're um, prioritizing hypothesis, generating solutions, taking actions and evaluate outcomes. Um, write a basic multiple choice question that is appropriate for that tag. Make sure you have the uh, answer and the rationales for both the right and wrong answers. I was going to give you all about five to 10 minutes and then check back in, but since we can't do that, I was going to have y'all work individually. Is that correct, um, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, if whatever, whatever you think is best there, but so it sounds like if everybody, anybody who would like to, like you said- I'll see who yeah. wants to share with me afterwards. <laughs> so what time is it, Five, uh, 4, 10? So at 4, 15, I'll see if somebody's ready. This is an easy one, this is a multiple choice. Y'all are good with those, right? I'm sure y'all write a lot of those, right? <laughs> So I'll give you all five minutes and then um, I'll come back and see who's who's uh, bold and daring to share with me.
All right. Can y'all see the whiteboard? It's my first time using the whiteboard thing. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes, awesome. I can see it. So who's going to be the guinea pig? Volunteers? <laughs> Somebody give me their question they wrote so we can look at it. Oh, we have a raised hand. Oh, yay. Thank you, Diana. Um, so we'll try to hear how we do this. Um, oh, no, Anthony. It's my first time touching the whiteboard. Okay. Wait, we might need... <laughs> On Zoom. I might need to provide a link here. Hold on one second. I think, I think, um, hold on, I'm just going to go grab it. Uh, okay, one second. Oh. Okay. So I wonder if the best way to do this, um, I don't know if we could get, I'm trying to see if, if, thank you for, maybe could you put your question, is it potentially available to put it in the chat? I don't know. Is, is she able to talk? I could type it as she I could. I could, I could uh, yes, we can. Um, sorry. Let me, uh, Sorry, y'all. This is some technical difficulties. Yes, we're just, this is all on us. Um, oh, I see. A lot of talk. Oh, there you go. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Oh, perfect. Okay. So my question that I wrote down, patient presents with shortness of breath cough, SpO2 of 89% and a respiratory rate of 24. What action okay, should the on. nurse- SpO2 oh. of what? 89%. Oh, I thought you said 29. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I'd be impressed if they were short of breath with a SpO2 of 89%. <laughs> I know, right? They're not big. They're respiratory rate of 24. Okay. I was definitely not a secretary in my other life. Go ahead. Um, what should the what action should the nurse take? Okay. Choice A. Yep. Collect past medical history, including medications and allergies. Medications, allergies. B. B, place the patient on O2 via nasal cannula. C. And then letter C, assess lung sounds. And D. Obtain full set of vital signs, including blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. Including heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature? Is that what you Correct. said? And your correct answer you said was? Uh, B. And you've said the tag, the CJM tag, M tag was what? Uh, recognize cues. Okay. So now that I actually typed it, I can read it. <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit. And I, if, um, Anthony, do you mind man in the chat if somebody answers? Absolutely, yeah. All right, so um, patient presents with a shortness of breath, cough, SpO2 of 89% and respiratory rate of 24. What action should the nurse take? Now I try to type it just like you told me because I wanted to point out some things. Before I move on to the answer choices, does anyone have any feedback from the stuff we talked about 
with the question first. can't see all the chat. Got several um, we're there. seeing, um, so it seems like some, I don't know if some people actually can see it and, and others can't because some folks are saying they can't see it, but and others can. Okay, they can see it. Um, oh, wait, now we're getting a lot of, a lot of. Uh, Client instead of patient. I, I definitely agree with that because remember, we want to keep the wording the same. Mm, let's see. Okay. Yes, I, several people have said client instead of patient. So I agree we should change that to client. Raise head of bed was the. So they feel like raise head of bed should be a choice. Mm, it could be. We ain't got to the choices yet, though. We want to start oh, with okay. just the question first. So we should change patient to client. So if we change that, it would say client presents with shortness of breath, cough, SpO2 of 89% and respiratory rate of 24. What action should the nurse take? Needs context for pediatric versus adult. Yes, maybe in this case, because we gave a respiratory rate, I, I agree that we, in this case, it may, now we don't have to necessarily give an age, but you might want to say adult client, because if we don't know what age at all, respiratory rate of 24 might not be a problem. So I agree that we could say adult client. We don't necessarily have to put age in this case, but adult would be good enough. Anything else? Should say the nurse is assess should say the nurse is assessing the client it would be better to say that because you're trying to make the nurse do something so nurse is assessing a client um, that presents with that's fine too if you wanted to put that um did anyone see the spo2 spell out oxygen thank you lorinda yes so these are terms that it's easy when you use them every day and I appreciate this, Donna. Please, uh, Diana, please don't think we're, we're picking on you. I've so You're so brave for putting this on here in front of a bunch of people. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. I know, right? Might as well be you. <laughs> but there is a lot of little things. And I, I, as many times as I've done this, I'll still do the same thing because we're so used to saying SpO2, but that's not what they're going to say on NCLEX. They're going to say oxygen saturation of because that's what they're gonna do. They don't want us to leave it to chance. SpO2 may be what they use over at this hospital, but NCLEX is not just in North, uh, New York, uh, you know, it's international. It's not just here. You can go to London and take your NCLEX. I've had students do that, you know what I mean? So you wanna be sure you spell it out. Um, I'm glad that she put respiratory rate all the way out because that's perfect. And you are very right, we need to say adult patient. And then what action should the nurse take? Here's where it gets sticky with the action. Because you said the, the recognized cues is the tag, then we really can't ask them for an action because we're actually asking, with recognized cues, we're actually asking for an assessment. Um, so it should be more like, what should the nurse do first? Because an assessment is something they can do. But if you're asking for an action, you're almost making this an implementation take actions. You see okay, well, that would definitely be my preference then would be to, to um, what should the, the take action first? piece, the implementation. So yes. Okay, so we'll change this to, to take actions. And then let's look at the choices. So we got collect past medical history, including medications and allergies, place the patient on O2, which we should spell out oxygen, you know, via nasal cannula. Usually, um, one thing I do know, they'll give them an amount a lot of times. So O2 at two liters, for whatever reason they always do. Um, assess lung sounds and then obtain a full set of vitals and you give a lot. So here's one of the things before I even look at what the answer is and all that, that we, we tell our students is, and we tell the test writers the same thing because as much as we teach our students, this is a funny part, as much as we teach our students all these test taking skills, we turn around and tell the test taker writers that this is the skills, try not to do these things. <laughs> Um, so you want to make all your choices very similar in length. So C is very, very short, right? And then all the rest of them are long. So you'd want to add something to that or you want to take away. One of the things NCLEX kind of tries not to do as well is they don't like to put a lot of ands. So it would say collect past medical history. You could put including medications or including allergies, but a lot of times past medical history is understood that it includes that. So you leave it alone. 
um, place patient on nasal cannula, that's, that's good enough, assess lung count sounds, and then obtain full set of vitals. You don't have to say including heart rate and all that. That's really stuff that doesn't even need to be said because as the new nurse, they are supposed to know that that is what vital signs includes. So the extra words that are in there actually don't even have to be in there. And when you take it out, you'll see they'll almost all be the same length at that point, right? And then you said that um, B is your answer. Place a uh, patient on O2 via nasal cannula. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Everyone... Anyone not agree with their answer? Are we all good with that? Would the nasal cannula not need a value? Yes, I, that's what I was saying. We need to put in a value. That's the only thing that I would say that we couldn't say it was correct unless we had a value because for all you know, I could be putting them on O2 at 15 liters. So that's why I think that um, NCLEX always puts a number because really as nurses, depending on the state you're in, you can only use two to four liters in Georgia and without an order so unless you're in a code so it depends on where you're at so they tend to put like the minimum value of whatever area um so they're going to put a number that is one thing let's see need to stay say the priority because you do all this this could be ranked and that as that's why i said she could use which action would you take first um that would make it a priority action um, and she did say she wanted to take it from recognizing cues to make it take action. So it would be right. Um, is that somebody, Joyce, you're saying in, in, in Texas, you can do 21 liters a minute without an order? That can't be right. I must be reading that wrong. You mean two liters, right? I hope so. I don't know who, to, who got 21. The thing only goes to 15, don't it? <laughs> I don't get the right O2 thing then because mine goes to 15. I hope that says tw two liters per minute. Leaders, okay, thank you, Joyce. I was about to say, yeah, that's what I said. So you think about it when you you got to remember when you're thinking about when you're trying to prep them for NCLEX. NCLEX is not just in one state, right? Each state don't have their own. And then this is true. You said a COPD patient can present. Now, Laura, I do I do tell you this. You got to be careful because you're doing something that our students we tell them never to do. You don't add to the question. She did not say this is an adult patient with CO, uh, adult client with COPD. You can't add that to it. We're bad. We're just guilty as the as the students sometimes. This could be a COPD patient, but she did not say that. And we have to make sure that we teach the students not to do that because they will do that in a heartbeat, especially yours that have been EMTs or LMPNs and they're coming back to get their uh, their RN. They'll be like, well, and you know, that could be a COPD patient or, hey, that could be a patient that fell and bumped her head. You get all kinds of stuff or what I do in my practice. So those are the kind of things that we do ourselves that we got to tell them not to do. If you want this to be a COPD patient, you must say that this is a COPD patient and you can't put COPD. You have to put chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You can't put COPD patient either. So uh, there's a lot of little things that I think we do all the time that we don't think about that NCLEX doesn't do. And that little bit of difference sometimes will make a big difference when your student goes to test. So let's move on to, uh, uh, thank you so much, Diana. So let's move on to the next portion. Let me see if I can get right back to this, sharing the right stuff here. Oh, let's see. Go here. You know, um, one thing, uh, Emerald, mm -hmm. we have. So there are some questions. I don't know. I don't know what the if if now is the best time. Go ahead. Um, I guess I think a lot of stuff is getting was sort of answered, but let me, let me scroll back up if it's okay. Just, yeah, I think just, some of it was delayed coming through because I was trying to yeah. answer it as a go. And I think some people had typed it, but it didn't come through. I don't know how many people are on it, but a lot of times with Zoom, the more people, the longer okay. it takes for chat to cycle. <laughs> okay. Um, there was one question, and again, there was one about board vitals that might be actually for the general audience, but there was one question about, please explain more about blueprints and using the NCLEX test plan, plan, I teach fundamentals. Is there an example? So the the blueprint. Let me see if I could go back to the right slide. So the blueprint that I'm talking about is the one you can literally go on NCLEX and pull. It was like so right here, right here, the 2013. 
So, you know, when you tag your, your questions, you have more than one tag. So you'll have the bloom. So is it a, 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 a you know, a, 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 a analyzing question and applying question, blah, blah, blah. Then you'll have your, depending on if you're ASIN accredited, you might have, you know, one of their tags. There's multiple tags when you use any of the software. Um, if you use ExamSoft, they have like 50 million tags you can choose to use. They usually, almost every nursing program I've ever been in also includes the, the nursing process and the next, the, the NCLEX tag. So when you look at the NCLEX tag, you'll have safe and effective care, uh, client environment, management of care. Well, if you look at the, the plan here, management of care should be 15 to 21%. Well, when you're making your blueprint to decide what your class, so if you're teaching fundamentals, when you're deciding what your class and the amount of questions you're going to put under each topic is going to be, you should try to follow the, NIC, the, the NCLEX as much as possible so that you're not over testing on one thing and under testing on another. Some of these things may even be a step up item. So like farm, farm is one of the harder things for nursing students. It's just something that they can't seem to remember their meds. They can't, and it's not even that we ask them, hey, what does this med do? Just understanding what they need to teach the patient and the side effects seems to be difficult. So even though there's up to 19% in our program, when we stepped out our exam blueprints, we caused the, the pharmacology to be a step up. So in the first year, they only get 10%, then it moves up to 12% in the next class. So they don't actually get all the way up to 13 to 19% till they get to my class maybe. So looking at this NCLEX test plan is a good way when y'all are sitting down and deciding how you wanna make the difficulty of your test and what you want to put on the test so that you're not testing them all on management of care and never asking them any basic care and comfort. Um, for the longest, when we weren't using this plan, that was happening to us. We were testing a lot on other stuff and stuff like basic care and comfort. They get to me and they don't know anything about an NG tube because that's under basic care and comfort. We do a lot of NG tubes and PEG tubes. You don't know anything about the care. You don't know anything about taking residuals. Why? Because you've never been tested on it. And we all know if they ain't been tested on it, that's going to get flushed away much faster than something they've been tested on. They already flush away the stuff they, that we test them on fast enough. But that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, I, I can't see the chat right now. Did that clear that up, Anthony? For the... Um... the person that asked well I, I i don't know if i don't know if it's turned but it was definitely thorough response um um that's great and i i i and sorry yeah sorry if it deviated it, it was asked a while ago so i just wanted to make sure we got to it before we moved on so but I, yeah i think that's great i think we can probably move move forward okay. um, yeah. um so uh moving on to the second part so um the x the nclex prior to the engine contained certain question formats your regular multiple choice, which we just wrote one, right? Thank you, Diane. Um, your select all that apply, your fill in the blank, um, chart and exhibit where you had, you know, a picture or a piece of the chart that they had to look at to be able to answer the question, your drag and drop, your ordered response. So put these in the order that they should go in and your graphic where there's a picture like graphic I use a lot for dysrhythmias. Here's your strip. What is that? What do you do to treat it? That kind of thing. Um, in this section, though, we're going to look at specific formatting changes that are related to your standalone NCLEX items. So that's your question that has no trending and no case study. It's just a separate question, but there's formatting changes in the separate questions. Those formatting changes are going to be your extended multiple response, your multiple response in, which are both SATAs, your other SATAs, which are your group multiple response, your group response in. Um, your extended drag and drop, your closed drop downs, your enhanced hot spots and your matrix, grid, matrix grids. Now, that's not to say that these, these single um, standalone items, they can also use these type of questions within the case studies, but they also can use these as separate. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we talk about the case studies. They can be used within there, but these are, when you're looking at a standalone item, these are some of the changes that you're going to see. So the format that's probably the easiest to learn to write since most people already do select all that apply is going to be your extended SATAs. Um, the difference between an extended um, multiple SATA uh, and your regular one is the amount of answer choices. So your regular SATA is about five to six answer choices. In the extended SATA, there are eight to 10 choices. Um, one can be correct or all of them can be correct. So it's very important that when you 
start going through these changes. And I highly recommend that at some point in the program that you teach your students how to answer these questions and what is expected of them. Um, when we first started switching over, that was the biggest panic is they didn't know what they were supposed to do. At least expose them to these so they understand what's expected of them. It, it, it decreases some of that anxiety when they get this question. They're like, oh my God, there's 20 responses. Yeah, well, there's eight to 10. It's not 20. Calm down. But they do need to be aware because a lot of them don't think all of them can be correct. And a lot of them don't think only one can be correct. Yes, only one can be correct. And yes, all of them can be correct. They need to understand that because there's been plenty of times, even on my regular status, that they're like, well, I thought they were all right, but I didn't want to choose them because I didn't think all of them could be correct. They can. So they didn't know that. Um, there's also extended multiple response N, which is the exact same as this extended SATA, except for the examinee is told how many to choose. So when you see the N after any of these types of um, formats, it just means they're given the number. So they'll have eight to 10 responses. They'll have a regular multiple, you know, select all um, the apply question, but it'll say select five from the list. And then when they select those five, whether they're the right or wrong five, it won't allow them to select anymore. So anytime you see the N behind one of these um, types of different changes of formats, it just means they're given the number that they're supposed to give, uh, supposed to select. So it makes it easier, maybe. Sometimes it don't because if they have no clue what the answers are, it ain't gonna matter how many they know to pick, right? Your uh, next format is gonna be your grouped multiple response. This is another SATA. Uh, in this format, the examinees are given a selection of categories and they have to choose an answer choice in each category. One or even all in each category can be correct. Um, at least one answer in each category is correct though. So they have to choose one from every category but they can ch choose up to all. And if they get the grouped response N SATA, this is where they're given the number. So select one under each category, select three under each category kind of thing. So there, that's, like I said, when you get the N, that tells them how many. So like you see right here, you got uh, imaging, monitoring, medication. So if they asked a question and gave them a disease process and it says, select the anticipated, um, and again, it wouldn't say physician. This is an old picture that I had, but select the provider's orders from the following categories. So if it doesn't have the N, it's just a regular group response, they could pick chest X-ray, X echo, the abdominal X ultrasound, the, the upper GI series. They can choose all of them under in imaging, all of them under monitoring, all of them under medications. Or they can just choose one, but they better choose at least one under imaging, one under monitoring, and one under medications, because at a minimum, at least one response under each will be you know, um, needed. However, if they're given the N, they might tell them choose two under each, then they know they need to choose two under each. Your next type of format is your extended drag and drop. So this format is the same concept as the regular drag and drops that we use, where you take the answer and put it where it's supposed to go. The difference is that these are um, these have more selections and they're presented in a different structure known as a bow tie. Um, you've probably heard that a lot. I think when I first started having to write um, NCLEX questions, this scared me the most because I was like, what the heck is that? Um, and they can be some of the trickier ones to write. Um, and that's just because they're required to say actions to take on one side, potential conditions in another, and parameters to monitor on the other side. Now, if you're writing med surge, that's cool. But when you have to do research and leadership questions, that gets a little bit harder. Um, you have to be a little bit more inventive when it comes to that kind of question. So if you're going to take up bow tie questions, I highly recommend it be for a disease process. Like I said, I've, I've written for a couple of, I'm not going to name the, the other uh, companies, but I've written for a couple of companies that come out with NCLEX books and they have literally assigned me, okay, you're going to do leadership and here's, I want you to do 10 bow ties. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? It was a lot of extra work. So I suggest until you are really, really comfortable with these and you want to get really inventive, stick with the med surgeon. They're much easier for these. Um, so the bow tie is meant to have examinees choose an answer that relates to um, each other, uh, actions on one side and monitoring for that same condition on another. Um, it looks like a bow tie because one in the middle will be selected and at least two on each other side. Now it's usually going to tell them how many answers on each side to pick. So they don't have to guess how many. 
um, but they can have two to five to choose from on each side, and they can have up to four in the middle to choose from. But the idea is you're given a sentence or you're given an, uh, a chart information, question, whatever they want to present it as, and they say, okay, here's what you're present presented as. What is the potential condition that your client has? Okay, so you look on here, okay, well, they might have pneumonia. I mean, I don't even look at the choices on this one. I would say atrial fib. How about that? Okay, so they might have atrial fib. Okay, so now you're saying that they have atrial fib by the presentation they're giving them. What actions are you going to take? All right, well, this is a new atrial fib person. I guess I'll do cardioversion and verapamil. Whether or not that be right, that's what they're going to choose on this side. It says what they're going to monitor. Well, I'm going to do troponin and heart rate. So you, when you finish, you'll look at it. It's going to look like a bow tie because you have something skinny in the middle with the two ends on the side. That's why they call it a bow tie. Um, but no matter how many you choose on either side, there's usually only one in the middle. You are going to tell them how many they need to choose on each side. Um, like I said, these things are not super hard to write. It just becomes much more creative because you ha it has to say actions to take. They don't put nothing else there. It has to say potential conditions and it has to say parameters to monitor. So you can see how that would be a little bit harder when you're talking about um, issues like leadership and research. That was very, I have PTSD over that one. Um, but even as a normal client of fundamentals, you can use a, a, a risk for and use, use this same format and still do it. I had no problem with those. It's just harder when you're trying to do abstract concepts. So when you first start writing these things, I suggest stay in the clear water and stay away from the muddies until you're more clear on how to do these. Um, your next kind are your closed drop down. So these are drop down boxes that are used to as a fill in the blank style or a table style. The examinee has to pick the multiple blanks and fill in um, to choose a box from each selection. I think we used these before, um, but they're more, um, for next gen, I think they're more succinct. Um, I put some of these on test way back when, but I don't think they were even like, oh, this is something you use all the time. This is where your rationales uh, grading can come into play because if you're putting something in the first block, and the second block has to relate to it, then they're either gonna get it all wrong or all right based on that. But if the first block doesn't relate to the second block, then they can get a plus or minus grade. That's your rationale grading. So you're basically filling in the blanks or on a sentence or on a table by drop down the box. Each box is gonna have at least three options, if not more, to fill in the blanks for that. The next is your enhanced hotspot. So um, if you're familiar with hotspot now, um, a lot of it, the hotspots we use now are like pictures. You show them a picture and say, okay, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of one I've used. Uh, I used one for INOs when I was doing first year and I had them look at the, the um, uh, chest tube, uh, picture of the chest tube um, drainage thing. And I had the mark for where the last, um, nurse marked and I asked him, okay, you had this much output on your, uh, your chest tube, this um, shift, where would you put your mark? And they had to click on it. And the hotspot, you know, as long as you're within a certain parameter that you've marked, they, they mark it as right. Well, the hotspot that is ex what they considered enhanced is more of a highlighting system. So there's predefined words or phrases that are in the patient's chart clients, let me say that, clients chart um, that is expected to be highlighted based on the question. So they may say, um, you know, um, like this one, the nurse is caring for a 41 year old male client, which you wouldn't need the age in this one, which fi findings require follow up. And they highlight which finds require follow up. Now, it was used to be at first kind of concerned with this because I'm like, well, you know, if they don't put vital signs and they just check the vital signs, will that count them wrong? It doesn't because just like with the hot spot where there's a, a, a grace window that you give them, you give them the same with this. So if they only pick temperature and stuff, they're still right. If they click vital signs and that, they'll still be right. This can be lab values, nursing note, any portion of the, the medical record um, is a good way to use the hot spot. Your next one is the matrix grid. Now, I loved writing these because other than the extended SATA, I felt like this was just taking your SATAs and transforming them into a grid. So I think out of all the ones, this is the second 
easiest ones to learn to write. So if you wanted to write the extended set and learn a second one quick, this is probably your next best one. Um, it can have as little as one correct answer or all. The biggest thing, and, and this is going to sound really silly, but it, I found out it really wasn't, is to make sure your students understand what a row and a column is. They cannot answer these questions if they do not understand that a row goes across this way and a column goes this way. I don't know why that's so confusing, but apparently it is. Um, the button shape is going to indicate how many they can even choose in a, a particular row. So if they're circles, they can only choose one. So the one on the right, then you see how they're set up. So like right here, you got the potential intervention. This is the one on the right. And they have a bunch of different things that, that, that the nurse could do for whatever client they're presenting. It's either indicated, contraindicated, or non-essential either way. They're circles, so they can only click one. And it makes sense because something can't be indicated and contraindicated at the same time, right? So they're going to prepare the uh, client for defibrillation. Well, you go across the row and you click one. If they don't understand that that row is across, ain't no telling what they're going to click. On the left-hand side, you have the square boxes. The square boxes mean they can choose more than one. And it makes sense in this one. Client findings, fever. Fever can be um, applicable for pneumonia, UTI, and influenza. So they can click box all three of those. Confusion. Well, if they're old, UTI it might work for. Pneumonia it might work for. Influenza, eh, not until it gets to pneumonia user. So I probably wouldn't check box that. Just saying. So that's how you, they know if it's more than one answer or only one answer. Um, it's important for them to understand how to answer these questions. Again, they sound like trivial stuff to us, but everything's trivial when you're writing the question. When you're on the other side trying to answer it and trying to decipher it, anything that you can wrap your mind around before you go to do that, it makes for a much better test experience for them. Um, so expectations as far as um, the different kinds of questions, your extended multiple response just reiterating this, they can select one or all the choices. When you get the N, they should be given specific number. Your group multiple response where you have those three different groups or four different however many groups, they can have to select at least one, but they can choose more than one from each category. If it is a group response N, they will be told how many for each category. Your extended drag and drop with the bow type, there should only be one answer in the middle. And then you should tell them how many on each side they are supposed to choose. And it has to be an even number. So if you say two, it should be two on both sides. Three is three on both sides. Your close down drop, they only have one answer that can be right in each drop down box. You can have 50 drop down boxes if you like, but only one answer from each box should be right. When you do the highlighting, um, I suggest you make it only a couple areas because it gets to be very difficult when you're trying to make these to have 50 areas to highlight. And NCLEX usually doesn't go into this part of the chart, this part of the chart, this part of the chart. The question is very succinct. So it's going to ask you what action, and you're going to look at this is what action the nurse did that resulted in this. And then your matrix grid, um, if it is a circle, you can only choose one answer from each row. If it's square, it's more than one that they're able to choose. So here goes our attempt at a practice again. Um, this is where the next breakout would have been. I wanted um, y'all to choose an alternate format. I don't care which one. I do recommend you don't try a bow tie unless you're feeling really froggy. And if you do want to do the bow tie, I would love for you to be the volunteer person um, to show us when we get to the white bar board. I'm going to give y'all another five minutes or so to attempt to do any one of the ones that we talked about. Um, Extended SATA or matrix, if you've never written an NCLEX um, one in next gen at all before, is probably your easiest best bet. And then I'm going to come back and we'll try to whiteboard this.
All right, I don't know if y'all can see the whiteboard. I tried to answer some of the questions in the chat while I was waiting on y'all to do your thing. So if you put a question in the chat, I saw some stuff about the LMS systems and um, hotspots and ordered responses. So I tried to answer those just now. Are y'all able to see the whiteboard right now, Anthony? Yes. I, at least I, you know what? I could see it before and others couldn't. So maybe we'll, we should get heads up from others. Can y'all see it? <laughs> Give us a, uh... oh, we're getting a thumbs up. Okay. So Lots of do I get a thumbs up on somebody who's going to volunteer for me? Oh, this got quiet real quick. Don't be scared. It's all right. Don't nobody in this session know how to write them. That's why we're here. Come on now. Help me out. Oh, Tina raised her hand. How do you make her talk, Anthony? I'm trying to let Tina talk. Hold on. Nope, it won't let me. Can you do it on your side? Tina, uh, can you me? Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Okay. I, I believe it or not, I tried a bow tie. I've never written oh. one, but I thought I'd try it. <laughs> okay, let's see. So tell me the question first, and then we'll get the selection on the right, the middle, and the end, okay? So what's the question? Um. Well, I just, I thought I had to do like an action to take and then a potential condition and uh -huh. then a parameter monitor. That's the answer part. So you still uh, have to have a question. We, we can work with it though. So tell oh me. No, what... I, can, I can give you a question. Okay. Um, a patient on a telemetry unit displays the following rhythm. Telemetry unit. Oh, the client on the telemetry unit. Displays. The following rhythm. You said a client. You said change it to a client? Yeah. Okay, so is that what wait, I spelled rhythm wrong. It ain't it ain't shocking to me. I always spell this word wrong. And I teach dysrhythmia. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> All right, we're rolling with it. I don't I, I can't figure out how to spell it right now. I'm, I'm too tired. All right. Uh, what action should the nurse take? Okay. So what rhythm would you be showing them? Well, don't they select the rhythm like with a bow tie? Wouldn't they select one from the middle? And that's well, kind of how I wrote it. Well, here's the problem. You said a client on the rhythm uh, on the telemetry unit displays the following rhythm. So if you're telling them you're giving them the rhythm, then we need a picture of the rhythm, right? Right. I'll be honest. I didn't write a question because I thought that I was only supposed to do it from the three categories. Okay, so if you want me it. to give you what I did for a bow tie. Yes, or... let's do that. Can... And then we work. So what's the okay. first side you said potential? Tell me um, how you did it. I did a potential. Um, what did I do? Where did I write it? Select. Oh, the action to take is the first column. Okay. And then the middle column is the potential condition. Uh huh. And then the last column is the parameter to monitor. And then last is parameter to monitor. Look like we starting off right. I think I'm spelling this wrong too. Oh Lord, come on, I gotta do that too. This whiteboard don't like me any better than the thing did. Let's do it this way. Even if it comes out the wrong way, we know which side is what, right? Because this whiteboard don't like me either. This has been my whole semester, y'all. Everything, as it, I know Anthony says it's his fault, but I'm going to tell you, I have had nothing but technical difficulties okay. this whole semester. All right, so action to take. What do you have as your choices? So defibrillation. Defibrillation. Um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, echocardiogram or intubate. Well, on, on the next line, not oh, it's for but... potential condition. For actions to take, there's four oh. actions: defib, CPR, echo, or intubate. Okay, and now conditions, right? And then the middle conditions, I put normal sinus rhythm, mm -hmm. uh, ventricular fibrillation, or bradycardia. 
Hold on, hold on. Ventricular relation. And what was the last one? And bradycardia. Okay. Are we on the moon? Can you get in with the seven years rumors of month I've done? And then your parameters to monitor. Um, the pulse EKG monitor, client or temperature. So you got pulse EKG monitor, client or temperature. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Pulse EKG, client and temperature. And which ones did you say were the correct answers? Um, DFib and CPR, and then VFib, and then pulse and client. Okay. So let's think of a question we could put with that. If we want DFib and CPR to be our answers here, let me see if I can underline or text color. Let's see. We want those to be the answers. And you said uh, VFib, that, that's the only one that fits for that. Let's do VFib. And then you said, what was the last one? Pulse and, pulse and client. Pulse and client. And client. So we, can, we can't tell them this ventricular rhythm. So this is a good, now this is one of the things you'll see when you're writing these, these kind of questions. And this is something I realized really fast. Sometimes you're going to have to do a combined question type. This may be a graphic question with the bow tie, because in this case, I'm talking about a rhythm, but I can't tell them it's V-fib, right? Because right. it gives them the whole, the whole, you know, I put defibrillation, Lord. There we go. I can't tell them it's V-fib or I gave them the middle. So this is one where I would show them a graphic. I would say, just like you said, with the attached rhythm. So I would show them, a, a, I would put a rhythm strip and say, you know, you go into the client's room and this is showing on the monitor what actions should the nurse take? You know, the condition is, or, or you would choose, answer the question below to that kind of thing, right? So then we'll see, they would look at the rhythm and say, okay, this is ventricular fibrillation. What do I do for ventricular fibrillation? Where they need to monitor to see if they have a pulse because they shouldn't do anything till they know that this is truly right, right? Like you said, client and pulse because they want to look at the monitor I literally ran a couple of sims where I had the patient wasn't dead yet. And I just put them in VFib, a VTAC and VFib. And, you know, they started doing CPR and the patient said, why are you hurting me? <laughs> so <laughs> they should be looking at the client and not the monitor. So check the patient, check the pulse, make sure that that's the correct rhythm. Right. And that's the things they should be monitoring as you go through CPR as well. Um, so I think that if you put the strip, you could make this easily a bow tie question. So that's not too bad for your first attempt here. You take a little, a little tweak. I just there. had to learn to write the question. <laughs> yes, you just have to add this. Yes. And see, I'm, I'm glad you tried that because I might not have been clear enough when we did, when I talked about the bow tie that you actually have to have a question to go off of. So I appreciate that. That might have clarified something I might not have said because I am dead tired and 10 Dr. Peppers ain't did it for me. So, so I appreciate that, Tina, very much. <laughs> so I uh, guess we can move on to the next one. Thank you very much, Tina. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Let's see if I can go to the other share screen. Where am I at? Okay. Can you all now see the PowerPoint again? Okay. Yes, um, I, I want to share one thing. So, so, so we are going a bit long. Um, mm -hmm. And that's fine, you know, and, and I don't, Emerald, I don't want to obligate you. But if some if folks need to, to uh, depart, um, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the survey link now. So you all can capture that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give me one sec. Um, uh, so I just want to let everybody know that that's coming across. Um, I'm going to stay and finish. So it's okay if y'all if have the time to stay. I, like you said, I, it's not y'all's fault that we had technical difficulties. It's making yeah, this a little absolutely. longer. So Yeah, and I so appreciate your flexibility and everybody who wants to stay. But so essentially, there's a survey link in there that should be able to be accessed. Um, uh, so you'll see it has some general questions about perception of the, of the session, but then some stuff about what you learned. Um, and then so fill that in. 
Uh, and then we'll, and like we've said a few times, we will capture the information. Uh, we'll capture email and everything like that. So we can send the credit your way. We won't share that information or anything like that other than, you know, in this case, if your institution's like, can you verify this person attended this thing? We probably would share in that case. But other than that, we're not sharing. <laughs> um, so uh, we don't need to do it. We don't have your information if we provide it. So uh, the good thanks thing so much. Is it's yeah. recorded. So if you can't stay, yeah. you can come back and watch the rest of what you missed. Too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yep. Man, just put that in. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, and we'll put that, and if you miss it, we'll put that credit in again. We'll put that survey link in again in a little bit. So it's like up in the, in the, in the chat. Sorry. Uh, thanks. All right. So moving on to the last little couple different changes. So we talked about the, the standalone format. The next uh, format change is they've come up with trending items. Um, so the trending items are similar to standalone, but they are questions that are meant to give the examinee two snapshots in time. It shows a change in the presented client and then ask them asks them to make a change based on those change, uh, ask them to make a decision based on that change. So it's not like a case study where they're going through all the tags and they're you know, showing a lot of differences in how the client presents. It's literally a standalone question that gives them a snapshot in time, like maybe like I got over here, the vital signs have changed or the labs have changed or the nursing note shows two different assessments and the patient has taken a, a turn for the worse they give them this snapshot and say, okay, now what does the nurse do about it kind of thing. So when you write these questions, it needs to be that you're writing the question about the change that has occurred. That's the whole point of the trending question in the first place. Um, so um, possible information you can use for this, your nursing notes, history and physical, lab results, vital signs, admission notes. Um, I love to do this with admission notes and then the next shift comes on and there's a big change because that happens a lot in real life. Um, intake and output is um, really good to use when you're doing something like your people who need daily weights for your congestive heart failure and stuff like that, or your kidney disease people who are on dialysis and they miss dialysis for a couple of days. Um, I love doing those kind of things because I think that makes them easier. Um, vital signs is a good way to start. Um, and vital signs is really good for your, your first year classes, your fundamentals and stuff when they're just learning what it means to have vital signs out of range and what the patient can look like. So I like to do that for my lower year um, classes when I'm writing a trending question, but it's not a whole unfolding case study. It's literally, I show two snapshots in time and I say, okay, what do you do about it or what's going on and that kind of thing. The next thing you're gonna see that they use is chart tabs and this is used in your trending questions and your case study questions a whole lot. You can use these in the single standalone questions as well. It would be considered more of a graphic, um, but they will give them multiple tabs when you're looking in the case study. So um, when they answer these questions, you need to make sure your students know that they have to toggle between the tabs if they're given more than one tab. You won't see health history, nurses notes, vital signs and laboratory results on the NCLEX unless there's information under each of them. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna need all four of those tabs for each question. So if, you're, if they're using this um, for a case study question, you're gonna see that maybe the first question you need the nurses note, but you don't need the vital signs till you get to the third question. So they need to understand that you're given the chart in a, a case study question, just like you are in real, you know, nursing setting, it doesn't mean you need the whole chart to find out what's wrong with your client, no more than you do when you're looking at um, the case study question. So they need to know they need to read all the information. It takes them a little longer, but they need to know also that they may not need all of that information for each question. So when um, you're writing the trend, trending questions, it's important that the STEM is asking them specifically something about the change. Again, it's not a trending question. If you show a change, you don't ask anything about it. The CJMM tag that's gonna be applicable about the question is depending on the question, um, the change you're asking about. So are you asking them about something that they need to change by, you now need to reassess something? Or are you asking them about, about a change in assessment and they need to know what's going on so then now that's analyzing cues. That determines what tag you're gonna put on there. Um, the chart tabs do not have to be included in every trending question. However, if you are going to use a um, 
portion of the chart, you need to make sure that it's very clear what they're supposed to be looking at. Um, let's see. Next thing. So when you're teaching them how to answer trending questions, um, you need to make sure that they are very much careful about what they're looking at, because sometimes they may get a wide range of stuff. So you can do vital signs and you may do three or four days, but you may be asking specifically about day three and day five, because some of the charts that they give in NCLEX have a little more information on them, even for the trending question, because they want to show that they were stable first and now they took the downcline. So they need to see that, you know, I don't need to worry about the first three days of vitals. I need to see this change right here. They're not going to point out here is the change. So they have to understand that a trending question, not only do they have to answer about the change, they need to know where the change is. Um, a trending question, like I said, with all the NCLEX uh, next gen, they can use the other format. So I may have a trending question that says, highlight the area in the chart that is most concerning for the, you know, the, the nurse to report. And I have five days worth of vitals. Well, if the vitals have been normal until this point, this is the point they should be highlighting. So you see how it's a combined type of formatting change. I have a trending question, but it's in a highlighting, you know, advanced hotspot. So they can use the other format in a mix with both the trending that we're talking about and the case study we'll talk about in, in a few. Um, they need to be able to understand that they need to calculate data over time. They may have to actually make calculations. Um, this is good um, to use when you're doing dose cal. If you're teaching, like I teach the, the end course, so it's ICU, ED content. Um, if you're doing like critical drips, I like to use the trending questions for my critical drip um, course portion of my course because you know you get this order that says you start them on this amount then you titrate by this amount to keep their blood pressure or their cardiac output this amount and this is the max dose okay well you have three different calculations here trending over time so i first started their their rate at this amount milliliters per hour i went up this amount during this shift and their max amount is this so now you have to calculate three different dosages because i need to know how much I started them at, did I start them correctly? How much I had to go up in milligrams, even though I did it in milliliters. So I like to use these for um, complex math problems like that, because this is what you get when you go to ICU, here you go and figure this out. And you're trying to figure out the milliliters to milligram conversion. So I like to use that or microgram a lot of times, but I like to use it for those kind of things and make them really think. Um, so that's a really good way to use a trending question too. I think we'll skip the trending question practice because we're short on time um, and we're going to move into the uh, case study portion and that's the last portion anyway. We're very close to the finish, but I know some of you have to go and I don't want to keep you forever. So the last formatting thing it, that they changed was making case study questions. So this is the last thing that we're going to talk about. This is a change. The examinee is going to be given a case study that unfolds and asks them to answer questions at each interval of this unfolding case study to best judge their ability to go through a whole scenario with a patient like they would on the floor. Um, they'll have access to that scenario information throughout the whole question sequence. So if they're given a whole chart and this, the scenario, each question that pops up, that's still going to be there. So it's not like they have to try to memorize anything. And I think that was a big relief for my students. You would think that would be common sense, but they don't know when the first time they're going into this stuff. If you've never used a case study in your whole program and they're about to go to the NCLEX, they don't know if they're going to have access. So just telling them that is a big relief. You will have access to all that information, the entire case study. Um, they will um, have the same tagging order. So it will always be that they're asking them to recognize cues, analyze cues, prioritize hypothesis, generate solutions, take actions, and evaluate outcomes. Um, and they are always going to have six questions because there's six tags. They will always be in that order. That's a very good thing for us. So um, every, if I said it earlier, every um, next gen. NCLEX test taker is going to get three case studies and they're going to have six questions each. If you think about it, that's a big percentage of the test because if I got the minimum number of questions, 
that's 18 of those questions that I already know what they're asking me. So the NCLEX hack that I teach my students in my class is that you know what they're asking you. You may get a disease process you ain't never heard of in your life and it's in the case study, Lord forbid. Now that's six questions you think you're gonna miss, but not really, because if you know the first thing they're asking you is to assess something because it's always in this order and you understand the first question is recognize cues and they're asking you to assess something, that helps you deduce down. Because a lot of times they get it down to two answers and they can't figure out which one, even if they don't really know the whole disease process. If you teach your students these tags and what they mean and that they are gonna get all their case studies with this in this order, it's a big relief on them. They have an inside view of what they're asking them. So the first question is gonna be asking them to assess something. They understand that. The second one's going to be asking them what that assessment means. Then what are you going to do about it? And how are we going to plan to do that? And then what should you do? And how do you evaluate it worked? So I literally do a class day when we get into the first part of our second portion of the semester where it's all NCLEX prep. And I go over this. This is what these tags mean. This is what it's asking of you. It is a big NCLEX hack because that's 18 questions guaranteed that they at least know, if nothing else, what they're expected to answer. Because guaranteed, all four of those answers aren't going to say, you assess this, you assess this. You, that's not how it rolls. They're going to give them an, a mix of an action and an assessment, and it's just how the questions are always worded. So if they get it down to two and one says assess and one says do, well, I know the first question's assessment. I'm going to pick assess. I don't know nothing about myasthenia gravis. Let me choose assess because I know that first tag is assessment. So it is a big NCLEX hack to teach your students these tags. It's not just us that needs to know these tags. They're taking the test. They need to know these tags. It's going to help them. So teaching them about not just the tags, but the, the order, what to expect in the formatting change for both your standalone and your case studies, all of this alleviates some of their anxiety because you are going to find that the more they don't feel like they have control over this test, the worse they feel like their anxiety is going to be. Anything you can teach them going in is going to help them feel like they have more control over their test taking environment. So teaching them the tags, teaching them what is expected in each format change, letting them know again that they got that case study, they're going to have that information the whole time. Um, Additional tips that I teach the, my students that work really well is the priority frameworks. Um, I go into uh, in depth on how to use them when they do a question. If you think about what NCLEX is doing, like I said in the very beginning, they're trying to make sure you are safe when you get on the floor as a new nurse. They're not trying to test you as a nurse 20 years from now. They're trying to know, do you know the basic information to take care of a patient and be safe about it, right? So it comes down to, can you prioritize care and know what's the safest thing to do for this patient with this disease right now? Do you have these patients right here know which one you should go see first, right? Because it's a priority. There are a lot of different priority frameworks that we use and the ones they get stuck on are Maslow's hierarchy of needs and ABCs. Those are great and they work really good in first year, but when you start getting into my class, it may not always be ABCs. They come in in a trauma and they got blood squirting out their neck they can breathe all day, but I don't have any blood to push it around. It's not going to matter. So they have to know when to step outside of those. So the other priority frameworks you should be teaching them is Maslow's and ABC's. Safety and risk reduction. That works really good well when you're in first year to really push that on them. Um, survival potential, especially when you get into like my class and we're talking about reverse triage and MCE. Um, nursing process is a way to do priorities. Uh, least restrictive, least invasive, your acute versus chronic, unstable versus stable, and urgent versus non-urgent. That last one where you got the chronic, the unstable, and the urgent, that's one of the hardest ones for them to grasp. And I think that's one of the highest level thinking ones because it requires them to know more about the patient as a whole. So even though I recommend you start them thinking that way, they probably won't grasp it as much until they get to that last class. But all the other ones, they can start picking up a whole lot easier earlier in the program. And what I tell all my students is when you get it down to those last two and you can't decide, you start applying these. Start with this one, start with that one. Whichever one most of them apply to, Make your educated best guess. If 
six of the, the priorities say, yes, this one is right, and only two say the other one's right, choose the one with the six. Because if you don't know anyway, at least you're making the best educated guess. Because on NCLEX, they want to know, can you make the best, safest choice? And if they fit all these priority frameworks, you're making the best choice. So teaching them this is just as important as teaching them the tags, as teaching them how to answer the questions and what's expected of them. This is going to give your students the better chance at NCLEX success that first time. Um, and I'm speaking from a person that came to this program where we were down in the dumps. We started at 70 something percent and I made all these changes in the last class and advocated for so many changes in this program. We're now at a 98 percent pass rate. So I know this stuff works. And we came up through COVID and next gen to this 98% pass rate. So I know these things work. It's just about, it can't be just me in the last class teaching it. It has to be a change throughout your whole program. So if you were with the program and you're watching this because you're struggling, it's not this just the next gen, it's your whole thought process on what you think your students can handle. You have to teach them to think like a nurse from day one. And it's hard, but once you get them in that pattern, it makes it so much easier by the time they get ready to take the NCLEX. And it's not even like we have a, you know, most times you, you'll start with 90 students and you only graduate 30. We start with about 90 and at least 60 to 65 graduate. So it's not even like we're weeding a bunch of students out. So we have gotten a whole lot stronger from these changes. And that's why I like to teach these because I like to advocate for these changes that will make your program stronger overall. Um, so if you have a hard time with case studies, because this is the most advanced one you're going to have to do. I actually found a wonderful um, example. And if any of you are here from the University of Maryland School of Nursing, thank you for this, because this is actually wonderful for all of you who have never, ever written a case study um, and really need some help to walk through it. I put in uh, a... Um, link up here and I don't know Anthony I guess they can get it when they when you put the recording up but this is a database of the University of uh, Maryland school has it's open for you so I do not recommend you use these on tests I recommend you use this to learn how to do these better but they have multiple different next gen style case studies and it when you click on it it'll tell you hey this is uh, med surge for this disease process it is a wonderful little um Thing, you know, resource that they have that you can go in there and learn how to get better at writing case studies. So I really, really encourage if you have never done this and you're trying to do this, it is the hardest type to learn how to write um, because you have to have so much information. It has to relate so much. It's basically creating an imaginary patient with every little thing that's wrong all the lab results. And I do this a lot because this is how I teach my class. I literally, before Next Gen, like I said, I was doing this before Next Gen. I always felt that was the easiest way to teach my clients because in real life, stuff don't always go like the book says. So I have, I'll create case studies and throw them a, a curveball. Okay, well, I have this client, like one of the ones we did this semester. She um, massive burns and went into ARDS. Well, they wanted to give her Lasix, but do we really give her Lasix? We just fluid resuscitated her. Does that make sense? So I like to throw those things at them because it makes them critically think, are we really gonna do that for this patient? Because in the end, that's what we're asking them to do. We're not asking them to read the book and memorize. We're asking them to read the book and co combine that information and say, does this really apply in this situation? And that's what they have to do when they take the NCLEX. That's what these case studies actually force them to do. So if you think of it in that context, it makes sense why we give them so much information to answer these. And it goes in the same thing. You start with recognizing cues, you go to analyzing cues, and it goes all the way through. So each case study you make will have six questions. It'll be in that specific order. So when you think of the disease process first, you may find that when you first start writing these, because it was the same for me and the faculty here, it may take you a couple days to get one down that you really like. And as you go through it, you might say, well, if I made this change, it doesn't make sense here. So you may find yourself fixing certain things as you go along. As you get better at them, even now, as long as I've been writing them, it could take me three hours to do one easily. So when you get ready and set to do these, be aware there's very much a time investment in these. 
like I said, this database is a very good way to walk through because even though I had practice set up for here, we would never have finished a whole one. You probably would have got one question. Just getting the nurses notes and diagnostics and questions together is a lot in itself. So I really highly recommend you go on here so you can be walked through. I looked at multiple of these. They did a wonderful job. Just do not use them as a test because anything that your students can get, obviously <laughs> they can use, right? So you don't wanna let them uh, have access to something that you wanna use as a test. Not that they can memorize all of them and they probably wouldn't even know you got them offline, but I just have a thing. I never use test bank questions because of that if they have any access to it. So questions. So oh, nice. Do we have any questions? Um, we do have some questions in the Q and A, and we can we can uh, pop back up in the chat too. Um, there is one question, and I know you had asked in the chat about LMSs, so maybe we answer that already, or is it still? I did in the chat. I didn't say it out. out uh, they, somebody had asked me what kind of LMS systems um, actually have some of the next gen capability, and out of the ones that I worked with, I know ATI has. Um, you can both create your own, and they have some already built. Um, the exam soft, we used to be on that. You can build your own. Exam soft doesn't have anything built. You have to build all your own, but both of them are limited. You can't do all of the types. Um, there's no um, access that, that, none of them that I know that you can do all the types on yet. Um, ATI probably has the most robust amount that you can do um, and the easiest way to do them. And like I said, they have a lot that are already written too. And then, uh, and nobody can access them. There's no student access to those. Um, uh, Blackboard Ultra, which we're on now, has some limited uh, abilities to do some types, but you literally have to jump through so much hoops, so many hoops to be able to do it that I don't even use it in my course, even though I have access to it. I'd rather do ATI because I spend more time trying to technically put it in than writing the question. So, yep. Um, yeah. And, and I know, and so, you know, just, just for, and I, there is that, there's, I see a specific question up in the chat a little bit um, from, from Joyce King. Um, I, I want to address one thing about, about this, just on how this could work with an open resource. And I know, I know that this session was not necessarily about, Hey, use any specific textbook, even the open series, uh, the, the one program series um, or anything like that. However, um, we know that those costs increase, you know, like that they're, they get high uh, in terms of uh, the cost of those systems, especially something like an ATI. And, and there's really no downside to using them if, if they really help, because, uh, you know, ultimately it helps the students, but we know the costs get high. Um, you know, one of the benefits of using open textbooks and free textbooks is that at least that portion of the cost is reduced. You know, yeah. and maybe, maybe the cost for those other resources and the many resources that nurses and nursing students might need to use are still high. Um, but then finally, two other points. One is, I, I mentioned earlier on a session that often um, these companies come, you know, align with us. So we have in our, in our different disciplines, math, physics, biology, and so on, many homework system companies align their offerings with the OpenStax offering um, in order to, uh, you know, support those students. So that happens and often there's a savings there. Um, but then secondly, we will work on and maybe with some other collaborators from around the country uh, and these other organizations that have done some great work, such as OpenRN, um, to, uh, you know, have some of these formats available in various, and H5P was brought up before and so on. And we're, we're really working on making that possible uh, to go along with the textbooks. It's just a, you know, sort of a, we'll get the textbooks done first and then we'll do that. And again, I know I'm sort of getting into outside of the NCLEX prep realm, but just wanted to mention. Um, and then Joyce's question, Emerald, I don't know if you saw was, can you say it again, I guess, how to answer the case study, even if they know what, it, even if they don't know what it's talking about, I think you mentioned. So like with the tags, when you teach them, so the tags that I taught you on how they relate to the um, nursing process, so like recognize cues, they're asking for assessment, when they, it's a good test taking strategy for them to know when they have no clue about that disease process, if they know the tags, what they mean, what they're asking, and what order they go in, that's a way to help them answer the question because you're going to get four different answers, right, that you can choose. Maybe two of them are about assessment. You can at least whittle it down because if they don't know the disease at all, 
rather than just picking something random, they can at least pick something from assessment because they know the first question should be an assessment question. So it's about knowing those tags and what they mean and that they're gonna be in the same order every time. Like I said, I call it an NCLEX hack for them because at least they can say to themselves, okay, well, I don't know what this disease is, but I know the first question is asking me to assess the patient. So what am I going to assess? Oh, well, there's only one choice for assessment. I'm gonna choose that one. It gives them a better way to educatedly guess when they don't know anything about that disease because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can be in school for 10 years and never learn everything about the diseases out there. So, Right. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, um, just looking. Um, okay, so so I think uh, I think um, this has really been wonderful. Uh, I will. Uh, it was okay. I will. On the camera. Um, and I just thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bill Brew, for uh, just in case anybody wasn't on the previous session, uh, Emerald just did the nutrition uh, book overview and then did this session. So uh, she's been talking for quite a while um, uh, and uh, just tons of information. And uh, you'll see it, you know, like we're, we're amazed. We're the whole process, and I hope, I think Carrie gets uh, kind of expressed how much detail we went into on the development and how much we learned, you know, about nursing and nursing instruction. You all know it for years, you do it, but um, it's just a marvel to see how much has to be considered and then how you all consider it uh, in this process. So um, I hope that was really, really uh, helpful for everyone. We put the link for the, for the uh, session in, uh, sorry, the survey in. Um, so there's a lot of information that we can share, you know, coming out of this, we will do so. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that link from the Maryland site that, uh, that Dr. Bilber talked about, and we'll make sure we include that and other things. Um, I'll just a little, just an overview. Uh, tomorrow uh, is day two of this summit. We actually start off uh, at 9 a.m. Central with a session from Denise Neal and Cynthia O'Neill on um, uh, in, uh, competency-based education um uh and and how it can overlay with this series but also with oer in general uh and just how how the essentials can play its way into different types of programs and things like that and then we'll move into more book specific sessions there's a networking session and an implementation session so we hope you all join us for that um uh, emerald again uh thank you thank you thank you um any any final word i don't know i didn't mean to cut you off so i uh, anything you'd like to share as, as we as we sign off um, I think that I think that's it. I appreciate y'all having me. I mean, you know, this is the first one. So when y'all ready to have the next one, let me know. I'll see what what the hot topic is next year to do. <laughs> right, exactly. Definitely. Um, we'll hopefully have more. As you might have seen throughout the day, we've been getting a lot of requests and interest in other more books and other types of resources. So we're working on that. Um, but again, thank you everyone for being here. Yes, thank you, uh, Carrie just said it. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. It's been a wonderful day. Uh, we appreciate everybody staying a bit longer, dealing with some technical stuff, being patient. Um, and uh, and again, thanks thanks so much, Emerald. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, thanks so much to the Open Science team and the THECB team of putting this on. And we'll see you all tomorrow. So thanks so much. Have a great day, great evening.